you mind just pressing record for us? Perfect. Hi. So, yep. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining, and welcome to the Pearson Business Book Club. Um, today, I'm filling in um, for, for Eloise Cook. So for, for those who have um, have been to one of our book clubs before, uh, Eloise is the publisher for the professional business list um, here at Pearson. Um, I'm Arma. I, I am a channel marketing manager, so I manage all the marketing for uh, for the same list. Today is a, a really, really special day, um, and we're really excited about it, actually, because it's um, we're celebrating our first year anniversary of the book club. We uh, we, want, we launched uh, this time kind of last year. Uh, and I remember we started off our, our first one with um, zero people on the subscriber list and, and around 20 people to signed up for, for, for our first event. Um, and now kind of we fast forwarded a, a year and we've got oh, almost 11,000 people now signed up to our mailing list um, uh, and kind of oh, almost 200 uh, people registered for today, which is which is great. So we've come a really long way. Um, if anyone is interested in seeing the, um, the past sessions, you can visit the, the book club website uh, and you can see all, all of our past kind of videos as well. If if you've not joined before, uh, we choose one Pearson business or professional development book uh, every month, uh, and we invite the uh, the author to our book club uh, to discuss it. Uh, they also give a masterclass on a key concept from the book. Um, uh, and just to let you know, if if you need to leave halfway through the event, uh, the session is being recorded, and the video will be available on the book club website after the event. So today, our book of the month is uh, the presentation book by uh, Emma Ladden. I'm super, super excited to have you here, Emma. So thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, no worries at all. You know, what? I'm I'm really excited about this whole event. Um, my presentations could definitely be a lot better. So I'm really excited to watch your masterclass. If you haven't got a copy of the presentation book yet, you can buy it through the, the book club webpage. So you can just go to the site uh, and click on purchase now. Um, if you'd like to ask uh, Emma any questions, the, the chat functions available and the Q&A sections are available as well. So feel free to ask any questions there. After the masterclass, we will we'll go back through all the questions and we'll try and get them answered at the end of the session. So uh, introducing Emma. So, uh, Emma is a business coach and author of the presentation book. Um, the book was shortlisted for the Chartered Management Institute Management Book of the Year Award. Emma is also a former MTV and BBC presenter. Emma, we need to talk about this afterwards <laughs> as well. Um, and today she's going to be sharing with us the number one reason why most presentations fail. Um, and she will give a three-step presentation approach to make your next presentation the best presentation. Uh, make your next presentation your best presentation. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Emma, how how are you? How how is everything? Good. Yeah. No, I'm I'm so delighted to be here. And on your one-year anniversary, I feel very special. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah. No, I'm 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 great, and I'm incredibly passionate as you'll probably be able to tell about not only this book, but this topic. So I'm I'm just so happy to be able to be here today to talk about it. Oh, no, and we, we're really, really glad to have you. Um, so usually how, how this starts is we'll, we'll ask you three questions. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll jump in. Uh, oh, so the three questions, and then we'll go into the, the masterclass. So the okay. first question is, uh, where did you want to write this book? So um, as you mentioned, I had a, a career or a former career um, for 10 years. I worked exclusively as a TV and radio presenter um, for BBC and MTV. Yes, lots of stories. That's another another presentation. <laughs> but um, but media is the world of, of presenting. And I was in a job where, you know, every day, all day was all about presenting. And then after 10 years, I took a sidestep into business. And I just kept meeting all these very, very smart, very educated, very intelligent, very competent individuals from, from all walks of life and all walks of business who all had to present as part of their job. 
even, you know, they weren't even expecting it sometimes to have to present so much. And no one had ever really taught them or showed them how to do this. And they were confused. They were unsure what to do. They were using PowerPoint as a, as a crutch from what I could see. Um, and, and they just, they really didn't know. And also there was a lot of what I would describe as uh, myths around uh, presenting MYTHS, <laughs> you know, lots of sort of, oh, you don't have to prepare, you just stand up and do it. Or, oh, people on TV just naturally are like that. And I mean, nothing, nothing could be further, further from the truth. You know, the amount of research, production and preparation that goes into what you see on TV would, would astound you. So I wrote this book because after eight years of working with these wonderful individuals, um, I realized there was a massive challenge out there and that, you know, through my own experience and also working with these people, I developed a very simple three-step approach to help, you know, all of the business individuals out there that, you know, when they stand up to, to really stand out and, and feel good about it. You know, it's not easy to stand up and put yourself out there. It's a really vulnerable place to be for everybody. Um, and you want to feel as good as you can and as prepared as you can. So, you know, my goal is to help people do that. And that is why I wrote this book. Brilliant. And um, I mean, I'm definitely one of those people. So I've, I've done both approaches where I've, I've tried to wing a presentation and just tried to jump in there. And I've, also try to prep but actually um yeah it'll be great to see the three-step approach and uh, and how that works so um our next question is what surprised you about writing this book so i uh, i think there was two big things the first on a really personal note and without sounding too twee about it um, I, I've had some wonderful experiences I've got to interview movie stars and rock stars and go to some very cool VIP events and all that cool stuff. Um, but, but the truth is, it was only when I was writing this book that I guess I really felt like I had um, found my purpose. So of everything I've ever done, I suppose writing in general, but writing this book, because this was the first thing that I'd ever properly written, you know, outside of school really um i just i loved everything about it i just loved everything about sitting down and writing it and then in turn i love that it's out in the world and you know any given day you can get an email or a review or a note from someone who who again has challenges in this area and is is, is just trying to do their best um and they'll send you a note saying, look, I, I read the book and it really, really helped me, you know, cleared up that confusion or it empowered me or it gave me confidence. And that is not only very humbling, but it's it's very special, especially now that you can get that from, you know, anywhere in the globe type of thing, not just the people I reach individually. So, yeah, they were the two probably surprising things, how much I, I loved it and how much it felt like home to write. And then just reaching people I could never have reached one to one and the book having the impact. I guess I hoped it would, but, but you don't always know if it's going to have the same effect written down, you know. That makes sense. I mean, it's always it's always good to know kind of that, that w what we've done is kind of had an impact. Right. And um, yeah. Uh, I was at a seminar recently, and actually, and one of the things that someone said uh, there was actually you can get a lot of information online like there's a lot of information but actually some of these books have have golden nuggets actually that some things that you may not have noticed or may not have thought of before and actually it's great to know that actually that someone's picked up the book and actually read it and and actually what they've taken from that is kind of helped them progress right that's a uh, awesome um and the last question that we have before i pass on is how do you want readers to feel about reading your book yeah so i guess if we go back to some of the challenges um, when I meet people and I work with them. Um, something that comes up for a lot of people is, is just how uncomfortable and how nervous or anxious, and people have different words for it, you know, how they feel when they're presenting, putting themselves out there. And as I mentioned, it's a really vulnerable space, you know, and we are being judged, which is awful, you know, and that makes everybody feel uncomfortable, you know, that's that's hard for all of us. And um, 
I'm not able to make anybody feel like really comfortable because because I actually don't believe that's how it works. I don't think I've ever felt comfortable presenting. You're not really supposed to, but but you can feel really good and you can feel confident and you can feel in control and you can feel like you own your message and you can feel like, you know, you are the presentation rather than, you know, the slides being a crutch. Like you you really can feel very, very empowered and like you're really going in there um, with a message that you can deliver and it will get a result. And I guess that's ultimately what I want people to feel, to, to not be focusing so much on how they feel, which is totally normal. You know, we're in fight or flight. Every individual when they present is in fight or flight. It's just part of it, you know, and it's OK. It's just managing that and feeling confident enough within that to deliver this really great presentation. And that's, I suppose, the, the gap I'm hoping to bridge is to take, take it from a place of, this is very overwhelming and I'm in pure self-survival mode to, okay, you know, there's butterflies in the tummy and oh, deep breaths, you know, and the heart is racing, but you know, I've got this and I'm in control of this and I'm clear on what this is all about and I can do this, you know? That makes a lot of sense. I like it. I think in my opinion, I think there's, you get two types of people, right? You, you see the ones that are super confident that can present really, really well. Uh, and then you get the other ones that you could tell that are really nervous. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that surprised me, I, I spoke to someone that, that was I thought was amazing at presentations. And they, they said the same thing is, you know, I get, I get scared beforehand, but we do different things to prepare in advance. And, and actually, um, and that's part of it is being able to control control it and knowing that actually if you're prepared enough and you have the right approach, actually you can do this. Um, yeah, you, you can do it. Exactly. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pass on to you now, Emma, to, to run the, the 45 minute masterclass. Um, just to let everyone know before before I pass on, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the, the Q&A uh, and we'll get to them at the end. Oh, so Thank Emma. you, Emma. OK, I'll, I will just share my screen. Okay. Well get it up here from the beginning. All right. So um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. And uh, please let me know, Ame, if it's, if it's not coming through okay. So what I'd like to do today is talk to you all about the number one reason that presentations fail. And to do that, I'm gonna tell you the story of the Space Shuttle Columbia. In January 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia launched from Kennedy Space Station. There were seven astronauts on board, and this is them. 82 seconds after the shuttle launched, there was what was called a foam strike. So when a shuttle launches, there tends to be quite a lot of debris flying around, and that debris will always strike or hit the shuttle. And NASA called that a foam strike. Now, foam strikes happen all of the time, every single time there is a shuttle launch. But in January 2003, the engineers in NASA believed that this particular foam strike on that day was bigger and faster than any foam strike they had ever seen before. And they believed the shuttle was damaged. They believed there was now a hole in the wing and the shuttle was now in space. So what the engineers needed was a, a photograph, a satellite photograph of the shuttle in space to see if there was any damage. Now, this was not as easy to get as it may sound because it's a very expensive thing to get a satellite photograph. So what the engineers had to do, the engineers all the way down here in NASA had to convince the senior managers all the way up here in NASA to pay for this photograph. And this was challenging because foam strikes happen all of the time. So like, what is the big deal about this foam strike versus all the other foam strikes? So the engineers put in a few phone calls, sent a few emails, and eventually the senior managers in NASA came back and said, okay, come and tell us what the problem is with this particular foam strike. So the engineers did, I guess what any of us would do if we were going to speak to senior leadership they put together a PowerPoint presentation. Now there was quite a number of slides in the presentation. And what I'm about to show you is the real presentation. 
It is the very last slide of the presentation. And on that slide was the, the key message or the critical message the engineers were trying to get through. So it's not immediately clear, I don't, I don't think. So um, we're gonna we're gonna come back to this, okay? But but the most important message, the key message is on this slide. So let me come back to it. First of all, let me explain to you what the engineers did because it is fairly typical of how most of us approach presenting. So they began the presentation with a few slides on, you know, what is a foam strike? So a little bit of an introduction. Then what they did is they went into some detail about the foam strikes that have happened, the foam strikes that haven't happened, the foam strikes they've tested for. So it was all kind of in there. And then on the very, very last slide, as I just showed you, was the actual key message of the presentation. Now, when I first saw this, I was asked to identify what that key message was, and I didn't have a clue. <laughs> so I don't know if, if you looking at this are better than me. But um, if you go to the end of the slide and the second last sentence, flight condition is significantly outside of test database. That was, that was the message. That basically we have never, ever, ever, ever seen a foam strike like this before. That this is bigger and that this is faster than anything we have ever seen or ever tested for. And that's the danger. But they didn't say that now. What they said was flight condition is significantly outside a test database. And remember, this is the last slide in a series of, of slides, okay? But remember, this was all about getting a photograph. And I think it's really important to note that these were experts talking to experts. These were engineers talking to fellow engineers. So I would say there was a level of assumption around people's knowledge and a level of assumption around people's level of understanding and interest. Okay, so the senior managers in NASA sat through this entire presentation, there was a few of them, and they made a decision. And they decided that the Space Shuttle Columbia was safe and that there was no need for any sort of satellite photograph. On the 1st of February, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and all seven astronauts died. They later found out that the piece of debris or foam that hit the shuttle was the size of a suitcase and it caused a 10 inch hole in the heat shield in the wing of the shuttle, exactly as the engineers had suspected the entire time. So, as you can imagine, after, you know, such a tragedy, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board was set up to try and figure out, you know, what happened here and what went wrong here. So they really investigated two core areas. So they did look into the, the culture in NASA, and this is a huge report, and they had a lot of things to say about the culture, about the engineers down here and the senior managers up here. Um, they had a lot to say about that, but they also looked into the communications in NASA, specifically into the presentation that I shared with you, this particular presentation, the presentation given by the uh, engineers on the ground to the senior leaders in NASA. And there was one core finding, and it's this, that despite slide after slide after slide of data, the actual critical message never actually got through. The, the point never actually got through. They were very, very critical also of the use of PowerPoint as a tool. So they basically came out and said they felt the important message was lost. They felt that PowerPoint was an obstacle to internal communication that the use of PowerPoint and the way it was used had a dampening effect on clear thought and expression. And had the uncertainties been more clearly expressed, the need to inspect the wing may have been more obvious. So that last one is a big one. Had the uncertainties been more clearly expressed, the need to inspect the wing 
may have been more obvious. So the message was lost. Why? Why was the message lost? So first of all, the engineers, when they were compiling this really important presentation that they were really nervous to give and were in total self-survival mode about going to speak to their senior leaders, they were not actually thinking about the audience. They were thinking about themselves. And I know this because they asked them, what were you thinking when you put this together? And they said that they were thinking about, you know, coming across as credible. They were thinking about how important it was, you know, to, to have all the facts and have all the data. Um, and they were just really thinking about how they were going to come across to their senior leaders. And because that's all they were thinking about, or because they were in that kind of self-survival mode, they just wanted to survive this presentation to look confident, to look confident. They weren't able to structure and plan the information in the right way, because truly that key message, that should have been right up at the beginning. Now, should they have backed it up? Of course they should have backed it up, like, of course. But should they have walked in the door, you know, slammed their fist on the table and said, we need a photo or seven people are going to die? That's a little bit dramatic, but <laughs> it definitely should have been up front, not left till the second last line on the very last slide. And we're going to talk about this today. And here's the thing, because they didn't really think about the audience and because they didn't structure the information in that engaging way, they weren't able to persuade because it's too late. If you get to the point where the point I'm at now, the point where you're speaking, you haven't figured out those first two bits first, you can't do the third bit. It's actually not possible to be persuasive because you have to figure that out before you, you get to the speaking part. So the engineers didn't actually present, not really, not in the true sense of the word. So what is a great presentation? Because we know it when we see it, don't we? You know, whether it's a TED talk, whether it's someone in your organization, whether it's something you've seen on TV, whether it's an event you've been at, you've been sitting there and there's been a great presentation and you're like, oh my God, that's it. God, they're great. Is it their charisma? Is it their personality? Is it their voice? Is it their body language? Is it their clothes? Is it their stories? What is it? You know, it's, it's we know it when we see it. Remember when we had a great teacher in school, you know, they stand out. It's really hard to pinpoint <laughs> what we're actually looking at. So, yes, all that stuff, your voice, your body language, your, your charisma, that's a whole other presentation as well. But yes, that stuff is important. But that's actually not what makes a great presentation. It's actually much simpler than that. So a great presentation begins with the audience and it grabs the audience by the hand exactly where the audience is. And it takes them through their presentation one step at a time, never letting them step away. And a great presentation gets a result. A great presentation is audience focused. They're making the presentation so easy, so understandable, so enjoyable, so relevant that the audience can't step away. But that is not what many people do or not what many people are taught to do, as I shared with you earlier. What a lot of people do when they're told, you know, please come and do a presentation is they do this. They, they start to speak from the point that they think is important and they deliver what I describe as a kind of pick and mix approach. So I'm going to give you everything and I'm going to let you pick the bits that are important to you. So that tends to be an approach people take. And again, it's not that it's their fault that they're taking it. Again, no one's actually told them how to do it any differently. And they're really afraid they're going to leave something out. And their boss wants them to include one thing and they want to include one thing. And the marketing department wants them to include something else. And somebody else wants them to include something else. And they have all this stuff. And it's like, OK, I'll just put everything in and I'll put it all on the slides. And, you know, hopefully the audience will get something from it. But they're two very different approaches. One is audience focused. It is all about bringing the audience through the information in the best way. And the other is presenter focused or slide focused or data focused. And again, you know, find the word that, that fits with you better. But, but a bit like our engineers, you're in that self-survival space. It's, it's more about you 
than it is about the audience. And, and this is the number one reason presentations fail because of the approach, because of this slide focused, data focused, presenter focused approach. And one of the ways this shows up a lot that I see is people using PowerPoint as a crutch, as their own notes. Um, you know, it's the handout, it's the presentation that's going to the people that aren't in the room. It, it's just, and, and really they're all completely different things. And none of them are actually visual aids that should be used in a presentation. So this approach, you know, before you've even started, you, you've lost. So what I want to talk to you about today and give you some very, very simple techniques and tools that you can implement straight away. The minute you're off this call at three o'clock, you can go look at your next presentation and, and change it um, to be more in line with these things. Um, I think it's important to say a lot of this is, you know, best, best practice. I'm not saying it's all perfectly possible in, in every presentation that you do. Um, of course not. And you might have demands on you to, to present certain things in a certain way. But, you know, this is what we're aiming for. So to be an audience focused presenter, you've got to do what's called profiling your audience. You need to structure your messages and you need to design proper visual aids. And I'm going to show you how to do that now in the rest of this presentation. And then I'm going to answer all of your questions, I promise, or as many as, I, as many as I'm allowed, I will answer. So any audience anywhere in the world before any presentation is thinking two things. How long do I have to listen to this woman for? And what's in it for me? That's it. That's the secret. The only reason people listen is because of themselves. We listen because we are interested. We listen because we are going to gain or we listen because we are terrified we're going to lose. So if we don't listen, something negative is going to happen to us. Okay, so that's why people listen. So that's what I mean. It's not really to do with charisma, personality. I mean, all that stuff is great and it absolutely adds to this. But ultimately, people engage with you out of interest, benefit, and fear. Now, here's the thing. Are you ready? You are absolutely not allowed to rely on interest in a presentation. What? What? She says. So the problem with interest is, yes, you might have it. But A, you don't really know. And B, you don't really know how long you have it for. So it is risky. You can do it, but it is very, very risky to build a presentation that assumes, and it is an assumption, that assumes people are going to jump on with you at the beginning, stay with you through the whole thing and get to the result. Which means you must build a presentation that has what's called a hook, a benefit, or a fear or a reason to listen. Now, I want to be very clear, this does not have to be a big bells and whistles, cheerleading, ta-da, dramatic, nothing like that. Nothing silly, um, nothing out of the ordinary, nothing over theatrical, just literally a reason to listen. Why should they give you their attention? What is the benefit? What will they gain? Or what will they lose by not listening to you? And you got to do it very quick. So it is certainly not in any way new information for me to tell you that our attention spans are getting less and less all of the time, right? All of us. There's a really short window. There's a really short window where people are going to sit there and go, right, how long, how long am I listening here? And why am I listening? And you need to, at least in the beginning, give some sense of, of why this is worthwhile. So if we go back to what the engineers did, um, this model of, of communication or presentation, it's called qualifying before you state. Now, I wanna be very, very clear. There's nothing wrong with this. There is nothing wrong with qualifying before you state. There's nothing wrong with building up to your key point. Okay, but, but the risk or the problem comes in when people stop listening out of interest. So this model of communication assumes interest. So you can do it, but you are assuming, like our engineers in NASA, that everybody's gonna listen to the overview, listen to all the interesting facts and realize what it has to do with them. And they're gonna wait till the very, very end until you go, so in summary, here's the key information for you. So you are assuming interest. 
And when it comes to presenting, it's, it's risky to do that. So what I would ask you all to do, and something that you could probably do with a presentation you have right now on your laptop, if, if it's taken this approach, very simply, is flip it. So I cannot tell you the amount of presentations I've seen where we've literally taken the last slide and made it the first slide, and suddenly it's a different presentation. It, it, it's astonishing how many times that's happened with people I've worked with. So again, you wanna begin with the most important message. Now, I, again, I, I can't state this more clearly. There is probably 500 ways that you can do this, depending on the audience, depending on the message, depending on the presentation, the tone, the mood, the goal. You know, you can be very overt and just, you know, blurt it out. We are going to save you millions, you know, or you, you know, you can be more gentle about it. You know, we're here today to talk to you a better way that we can help you do business better. So, you know, you need to decide based on the presentation, what level of, of hook, what strength it needs to be. Um, but it needs to be there right up at the beginning. So again, if we go back to our engineers, as I mentioned, they could have come in and slammed their fist on the table, but I'm not sure the culture in NASA would have allowed for that. But they could have just come in and said, you know, flight condition is significantly outside a test database. We've never seen anything like this before. We really believe these guys are in trouble. You know, we need a photograph. And it, if they had just said that at the beginning rather than the end, it would have changed the presentation. Now, do you still need the supporting data and information? Of course you do. And in no way am I expecting you to leave that out. So you're gonna bring that in after you kind of make this compelling first point or this hook. But again, there's, there's a trick here too, that when you're going through this other information, you must make sure you continually loop back to the hook. So again, our engineers in NASA, you know, we believe this foam strike is outside of anything we've ever seen, okay? So then they go into, you know, five years ago, we had another foam strike. It was half the size, half the speed and it, it did a little bit of damage. And that's why we believe this foam strike has done more damage. So you keep linking back for the audience. And, and that's basically influencing. That's what influencing is. It's, it's linking the data or the points back to the main point for the audience. Now you can let the audience do that, but again, you're assuming they're going to, and they're gonna do it in the way that you want. Whereas a really, really good presenter will try and make those connections where humanly possible themselves. So this is called stating before you qualify and then, and then influencing as you go through the data. And again, this is something you can do straight away with a presentation you have probably on your laptop right now, changing very little. So a great presentation meets the audience where they are, brings them through all the data in the most enjoyable, easy, straightforward, structured, understandable way possible and gets to a result. So in order to do that, there's a few sort of pitfalls the presenter has to avoid. So the first is, we've talked a good bit about it here already, which is not being relevant. If at any stage, the presentation becomes irrelevant for the audience or the audience member feels, oh, you know, this, this is not for me. The what's in it for me just isn't there. I'm not interested. There's no benefit. And I'm not gonna lose out in any way if I, you know, if I turn off this Zoom, then it's gonna be very hard. To, to keep their attention because you don't have any of the three areas. So data overload is another big one. So look, this is a very, very tricky one because I don't think any, any of us are short of data. Like we have so much data, don't we? All of us, it's, we just live in this constant state of data overload. And then equally, and um, I can certainly say this is very true for, I work with a lot of engineers, a lot of academics, and I might work with an academic that has spent years, years researching um, something and writing papers and writing books. And then they have to give a presentation and I will say to them, no, 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 no. You have to leave at least half of that stuff out. And they will be like, I can't, I can't. I've worked so hard. You know, I have to tell the audience absolutely everything. 
but you can't because no audience, no audience on this planet is able to take in that information. It's just cognitive overload. So you have to know what to leave in and what to take out. So you have to have your, your bag of data beside you and based on the audience, you pull out the bits that are relevant and you build a presentation in the order that will keep the audience connected. If at any point the audience stops understanding, they will step away even just for a minute. So this is where you have to be really, really careful of concepts, jargon and acronyms. You know, industry speak. And look, all industries have a language. Publishing has a language, media has a language, um, presentation has a language, learning and development has a language. We all have a language. <laughs> And absolutely, there's an argument for, you know, within the industry, we understand each other, definitely to a point. But equally, I, I, I still and I've had experience of being in rooms where people where there's arguments over what an acronym means. <laughs> I thought it meant this. No, I thought it meant that. And a bit like our engineers in NASA, sometimes it can be really, really dangerous to assume a level of understanding or a level of concept understanding that just may not be there. So sometimes it can be best to speak in first degree words, not baby talk, but just in simple English that everybody can understand so that people don't have to step away to just kind of process it. Because that's all they'll do. They step away and they'll go. But then by the time they step back, you're, you're gone. You're gone off your, your kind of travelator, your presentation travelator, and they're not able to catch up with you. And then finally, the use of PowerPoint can be a real blocker when it comes to delivering a really fab presentation. And I guess this is the last um, area that I want to talk about for today before I, I take your questions. So I, I, I'm guessing, hoping not today, but I'm guessing you've all experienced death by PowerPoint. Um, I think it's pretty much what this picture indicates. So death by PowerPoint is your presenter that stands up, you know, with the slides full of text and just kind of reads. And you're sitting there going, if this was all you were going to do, I could have read it myself. So I think we've all experienced, you know, the death by PowerPoint. And again, it's really understandable why people do this, because it's, it's just so daunting to be up there. And if you're really confused about what to leave in, what to take out, what to say, what do you do when there's a mixed audience? That's a really tricky thing. What do you do when you have different audiences needing different things? So we'll just pop everything up there and hope everybody takes something from it. But, but that equals death by PowerPoint, which is, which is not what we want. So again, I wanna give you a few, just a few little tips and tricks around um, visual aids and, and how to use them and design them. So I guess the most important thing to say is that um, PowerPoint or the use of PowerPoint or, or whatever equivalent you use, depending on what technology you're using, it is the last thing you do, not the first. So very, very often, you know, I would meet people who, when they're set, when they're told, I need you to give a presentation, the laptop opens, PowerPoint is open and they start typing or they merge three different presentations that they already have or marketing sends them a big, huge deck. No offense to marketing. You know, but marketing has this beautiful big deck of 90 slides that it sends and goes, okay, pick and choose the slides you want. But but my point is that the process begins with slides and, and it can't, it can't begin with slides. So slides are the very, very last thing you do after you profile your audience and after you structure your messages and you figure out from your data bag what you're going to include. And then once you have all that, you build the visual aids to support that, not the other way around. So the, the visuals match you, you don't match them. So a visual aid and, and I guess a handout or your notes or the presentation that's for the people that are not here are very, very different things. So this is a visual aid. So very, very simply, a visual aid does not and should not work without the presenter speaking. So if I emailed you a picture of a shuttle with the word safe and said, there you go, good luck with your presentation skills, you'd be like, what is she talking about? I have no idea, what is this all about? Because unless I tell you the story of the Space Shuttle Columbia, this random slide with a shuttle on it means nothing. 
In other words, the visual aid does not work without the presenter. So a visual aid is just for the presentation and, and just used when the presenter is there. It's not what you send to people afterwards or to the people that aren't there. So that type of thing, the handout, the notes, the presentation for the people that aren't there, it will look slightly different. So I bet you're all reading it there. Of course you are, because that's what we would all do. You put up anything to do with text and, and people start reading. So this is the difference. One is essentially a, a document and one is a visual aid and, and they are different. And a lot of times when you're presenting, you may have to prepare you know, visual aids for you as the presenter and then, and then notes for you as the presenter and then the handout or the proposal doc or the deck you know, for the people that aren't there or want to take something away. The idea is it's one message per slide. So again, this is, this is purely when you're presenting. This is when you're doing the bit that I'm doing now. Do you have any idea how many slides I've used? Does it matter how many slides I've used? Are you counting? It's definitely more than 10 though, right? Like it's, it's a good few slides. So I actually said to you, you've just, you know, you've just listened to 15 or watched 15 slides. You'd be like, what? That's a lot of slides, Emma, my God. But it doesn't really matter because when you're presenting, it should only be one message per slide. Well, hopefully. So the idea is that people look up at your presentation and they go, ah, I see. Ah, I get it. So your, your visual should create clarity around the concept and idea that you're talking about. So one key message should pop out of every single slide. Now, you are, it's okay to use some text. Of course, it's okay to use some text on a visual aid, but there shouldn't be so much text that you need punctuation. So if you need punctuation, except for a quote, um, again, you're going into written document territory. So, so try and pull yourself back. So the max is five words across and five words down. So that's kind of, that's a lot. That's 25 words, kind of five points. Now that is a busy slide. If you really had kind of five points of five, that's a busy, busy slide. So you do not want to put that up all together. What you want to do in that situation is use your transitions and you want to bring those points in one by one. And this is also a very good tip if you have a particularly busy slide. So, you know, I'm sitting here going, you know, have one message per slide and this is all ideal. But you might have a slide that you just have to deliver. Maybe it's a really busy graph. You just, you have to deliver it. And there's 10 points on it. And you have to do it. No matter what I say, you have to do it. So what I would say to you is in that situation, just don't put all 10 points up together or don't put the whole graph up in the beginning. Try and work it so that you're transitioning things in one by one. So even if at the end it's a really busy slide, it doesn't start that way and you're bringing people with you along on the journey. So again, a little too like transitioning can really make a difference to kind of keeping an audience with you because people read a lot quicker than you talk. That's kind of just how it works. And then I have two other um, little secret techniques and tools that if you can do them, are they're very sneaky and they're very, they look great. So the first is the presenter leads the slides and not the other way around. This is incredibly subtle, but very powerful if you can do it. So let me go back. Okay, so this is the slides leading me. I click, I look, and I talk. Okay, ready? I'll show you. So now I want to talk about text. You can have five words across and five words down. And you want to transition one by one. The presenter leads the slides, not the other way around. No, I'm, 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 I'm overemphasizing a little bit, but you get the idea. So in that scenario, I am almost using the slides as a prompt. I'm letting the slide come first and then I talk. In a perfect ideal world where you're really prepared and you know your content off by heart, you will lead the slide just by a word or two. So it's really subtle. So I will say to you, uh, da, 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 it's one message per slide. And then I will say, you absolutely can use text on a slide. 
Now, if you're starting to use punctuation, that's not the way that you want to go, but you can have five words across and you can have five words down. Now, if you are going to have that amount of text, because that's a lot, that's five different points, that's 25 words, what you want to try and do is bring those points in one by one. So I come first, the slide comes second. The presenter leads the slides, the slides don't lead the presenter. Now that takes a little bit, a lot of practice actually, and you don't have to do it for every single slide, but it is one of those techniques. If you can get to grips with your presentation enough and get the flow enough that you are in charge of the PowerPoint rather than the other way around, again, it's a very, very powerful technique that, that people will be like, I don't even know what they're doing, but it's, you know, you look like you have a lot of gravitas up there. And then this is another one that's uh, one of my favorites, B and W. This will change your life if you don't know this. Uh, so B for black and W for white. So when the screen is on full view, if you press B for black, the screen goes black. B for black, it comes back. W for white, the screen goes white. W for white, it comes back. Your slideshow has to be on full view. Now, word of warning. This is um, a brilliant way to get everybody to suddenly pay attention to you. So everyone's kind of watching the screen and you suddenly go B and everybody looks at you, especially if you're in a room. Um, this is really powerful. However, <laughs> another thing that has happened to me one time is too many. So I don't use this at often is someone will inevitably go, Emma, your screen is broken, which kind of loses the effect just a little bit. So you can also do white, which is maybe not quite as impactful as the screen going completely blank, but it does get everybody to pay attention to you. And again, this can be a really useful technique if, say, at the beginning of a presentation, you don't want to have the slides visible. You might want to say, you know, hi, everybody. This is why we're here today. And before we get into any of the data, can I just say X, Y, Z? OK, let's get into it. Boom. Um, or you're in the middle of it you're on a very busy slide or you're in the middle of your point and, and you're not sure if everybody's getting it, if you blank the screen and say, look, let's step away from the slides and take a moment. Let's take a moment to really understand what we're talking about here. You know, really make that connection, that eye contact. Get everybody away from the screen and focused on you. Now it's scary because everybody's focused on you, but it's, it's a really useful technique. And again, if you have a busier slide deck, and, and you're trying to sort of integrate some of these principles, but you can't really change the content. Really useful delivery tool. So B and W. And if you have a clicker like me, you can blank the screen with the little, the little square as well. But as I said, please be careful of black because it can look like your, your slides have gone down, which will totally interrupt your flow if someone says it to you. So audience focus presenting, there's three core points to this approach. This approach I want you all to take away and start to implement um, with all your communication, but obviously, especially your presentations. Profile your audience. Who are they? Why are they there? What's in it for them? What's the benefit? What's the fear? What do you need to tell them right at the beginning in the right way to get them to, to take this presentation seriously? Structure your messages. So you got to have your messages, you got to have your data, you got to have your information, but have it in the right order. Have a beginning, middle and end. <clears throat> have a middle, don't have a muddle. Um, make it three separate points, make it flow. You know, make sure it all connects. And then make sure once you have those two pieces in place, you design really strong visual aids that support not only you as a presenter having to stand up and do this, but the content and the messages that you are trying to get across. Now, if I had five hours, <laughs> I would sit here and talk to you about presentation skills and all the other parts of presentation skills, because there is all the body language and the voice and the performance piece and the standing and what do you do with your hands? Um, you'll have to get the book to do all that, or I'll have to come back and do a part two. But, but for today, um, because really 90%, 90% of the success of your presentation is, is determined here. You get this right. You have a connected audience, a structured presentation, and really strong visuals, or, or no visuals. 
You don't have to have visuals. That's the other thing to say. You don't even have to have them and only have them if they're going to complement your presentation. You are, you're 90% there. And then it's just the delivery stuff, which is important. But if you get this bit right, the rest will come because you're going to feel really good about what you're doing. So it's then just doing your rehearsal and getting your, getting your flow. Okay, I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to say thank you. And I, I can see that we have four questions already in the question box. So I might exit my own presentation just so that I can. Yeah. And um, oh, OK, a quarter to three. So we've just a few minutes for questions. And, and as I said, I can see four already in the chat. Um, Ame, I don't know if you want to talk me through them or. Yeah, oh, cool. Uh, uh, um, thanks so much for that, Emma. And yeah, I think uh, it was fantastic. Um, the questions so far. She, I can't actually see them. <laughs> oh, the oh, that's okay. Can... So I think we have. Um, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you very much. Yeah. I like the pace of the presentation. Uh, Jennifer had to jump off. So yes, just to, it will be recorded. Um, and actually, there doesn't cool. seem to be. Yeah. No worries. So, um, that's fine. So if, if you if you have any questions, feel, yes, please, please feel free to put them in the, the Q&A or, or the chat function uh, now or we'll try, try and answer them. Emma, I think that was absolutely fantastic. Oh. Um, you know what? I've, I've been one of those people that do the pick and mix option right at yes. the beginning. Uh, and I'm really guilty of putting lots of um, text on my slides. So, you know, I always have more than one point. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's um, I, it, I've taken a lot away from kind of what, what you said. Um, so I've, I've got one question come through so far. So um, nice session. So what is the ideal time that should be invested in making a clear and efficient presentation, which highlights the key message properly? Yeah. So that's a great question. Oh, oh my goodness. How long have you got is the question? So, um, you know, it's funny when I when I first started doing this uh, a long time ago, when I, when I first moved out of media and you'd asked me that question, I would have been like, you need to do 10 hours because that's how long it takes. And you know, there is an argument for, you know, lots of rehearsing and lots of preparing, you know, for your TED talk style talk. And if you're ever doing a TED talk, I would recommend 10 hours of preparation, <laughs> definitely. But you know, the, the truth is we, we don't have that kind of time. You know, nobody has that kind of time really, unless they are doing a huge, really high investment presentation. So that's one of the things in the second edition we looked at, you know, if you only have 15 minutes, which bit do I do? If I only have 30 minutes to prepare, which bit do I do? If I have an hour, what do I do? So what I would say is give it as much time as you can. And I, I really mean that. And it probably needs more than you think it does. So, you know, there is the steps to go through the profiling, the audience. So you, you can do a very simple profile of just sitting there and going, OK, if I was them, what question would I have? Right up to you can reach out to them, send them emails. If you know the audience, you know, I'm coming in to see you. What would you like me to cover? Da, 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 da. Um, the same with structuring. You know, you can sit down and do a high level beginning, middle, end and sort of put your data under those headings. Or you can literally be crystal clear on every single point that you're going to do, depending on on the time. Uh, I would say a rehearsal is vital. So when we stand up to speak for the first time, there are probably 50 different ways a sentence can come out of our mouths. So have you ever had that experience where you absolutely in like in your head, you're amazing. Like you're amazing in your own head. You know exactly what you're going to say. And then it takes you 30 words to say something that, you know, you could have said in six words. Right. But, but that's what we all do, because when we're actually speaking it out loud, it's uh, all the ums and the ahs and because we haven't found our pathway. And unfortunately, when we do that, when we um, when we are, uh, when we take that little bit too long to get to, to a point, it shows that we're unsure. So one of the things that I believe is vitally important as part of your preparation is rehearsing, even just once or twice, even the first couple of minutes, if you can't do the whole thing. But I would say knowing the audience and rehearsing are everything, because if you have those two things, at least the structure in the middle, 
you can make work, but you need to give it as much time as you can. And it's simple, but it's not easy. So it, it does take an investment of time. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. question though. Um, of course, I've seen a number of questions have come through. So we're going to try and get through Thanks. quick and fast. Um, so first one is any tips for dealing with interruptions? Yeah, oh, so interruptions are hard, especially when you're when you're in a flow. And the truth is, interruptions are in a way they're really positive because it means somebody's really engaged and they either want further clarification, which is good, or they're just really excited and passionate and they want to kind of get involved. Um, so you have an option to sort of say, hey, I'll answer questions at the end. No questions till the end. It's never an approach that I have gone for, even though I do prefer it, because it can put up a barrier. So I think you have to allow for questions. Um, one, two, obviously, if someone is, is nearly taking over the presentation, you know, you might want to say to them, look, I would love to have a conversation with you afterwards, a sidebar, a one-to-one. Or I'm, you could say to them, obviously, very politely, you know, I'm actually coming to that point in a minute, or would it be okay to hang on till the end? And I'll get to that point. And this would probably be only after one or two interruptions. So it's tricky because it's a positive thing, but it can really disrupt your, your flow. And actually, I see here, and I would like to answer this, is there a danger of choosing a visual aid that's too distracting? Yeah. Yeah, like... Visuals are a bit like telling a joke. You know, when people go, oh, tell a joke at the beginning. Mm. So if you're really funny, tell a joke, <laughs> maybe. But, but even if you tell a joke, ultimately, the audience will go, ha, 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 why am I here? Ha, 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 why am I listening? You know, so a joke is not a hook. It, it can be a lovely way to diffuse a room if you're funny. But oh, my God, if it doesn't work. It's awful. It's awful for you. It's awful for them. And it's it's just awful on your self-confidence. So again, you don't need a gimmick. And yeah, you do have to choose your visual aids really, really carefully. Um, yeah. So yes, there is a danger. So you do want to think about it, what visual you pick and is it appropriate and it is it going to achieve what you want to achieve? And do you err on the side of caution? Yes, maybe. And that's part of figuring out who's the audience and what do they need. Sorry, Emma, go ahead. That's yes, it, no worries. So, um, so I'll go from the chat. Sometimes it's difficult to know what message to focus on. Do you have any tips for figuring out what would be the most important message to get across th for the presentation? Yeah, so uh, again, um, you're absolutely right. There is no one size fits all at all. Um, and this is back to figuring out who your presentation is is aimed at. So. Um, if I try to give you a really broad example of, of how this works, I would have worked with a lot of people who are pitching to investors or pitching for business, or pitching to other companies. And again, you could assume, oh, it's always about the numbers or it's always about the figures. We'll lead with the figures. You know, we'll, we'll start off talking about how much money we'll make. And yes, that might be important to 70% of investors or 70% of business people. But actually, other companies or other investors may be more interested to know about your values, about your culture, about your way of working. Um, so again, what you decide to talk about depends on who you're talking to and where humanly possible you want to reach out and talk to them and ask them or at least get some insight if you can't reach out to them directly. So say I was trying to present that to Pearson. But I didn't want to reach out directly to Eloise or Amir because, you know, it would it would make me not look credible. I might try and find somebody else in publishing that I could talk to and say, look, I'm going in to pitch this book idea. What do you think are the key questions they might have? And um, so I will build a presentation around the key questions I believe my audience will have. And again, usually it's, you know, why should I listen? What's in it for me? What's different about this? Why will this sell? You know, you can normally, with a bit of a brainstorm, probably come up with with what they need. Oh, oh, brilliant. Thank you for that. There's a load of other questions in there, but we're, we're at time, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just share my screen really quickly. 
so let me try and move all of this. So uh, put this back into presentation mode. So just really have... quickly, I have to I have to answer this really quick question for the person wondering about the co-presenting. So tricky. It astonishes me that people co-present and don't come together. If you can't manage to do it together, just do your bit really, really, really well. But but try and get the person on board and do this process together at the very least. Um, or even you offer to do it and then give them slides to work with. But it's tricky because a co two people presenting should be one presentation, not two presentations. Sorry, sorry. Go. That's okay. no, no worries. If, if you do have any questions and and i know there was a few that we, that we weren't able to answer um you can get in touch with with emma on linkedin or sure. through through twitter yes and thank you all for for staying with me and i hope you enjoyed it oh uh, it's been absolutely fantastic i've i've really really enjoyed it and I, it looks like we've got loads of positive comments come through as well um and just quickly before i I end the session. Uh, our next uh, business book club event is um, with Greg Orm, the author of The Human Edge, and it's going to be a masterclass on demystifying the superpowers of chat GPT. Uh, the event is on Tuesday, the 25th of July at two o'clock, uh, and you can register for the event by visiting the book club uh, page uh, and then just registering. And if you sign up to the mailing list, we'll let you know um, all, all, all the future events uh, as and when they they come through. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing there and just finally just saying thank you so much, Emma. Like it, it, that was amazing. I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much to everyone that that um, for for kind of attending the event. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all on the next one. Super. And thank you. Awesome first hosting, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I <laughs> really appreciate it. Yeah, and 